Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to talk to you about ecosystem ecology. Now, ecosystem ecology is where it's all at. In other words, it's the culmination of populations and community. In other words, the interaction, biotic interaction between organisms like competition, symbiosis, predation. But for the first time, it incorporates the next hierarchy of understanding in terms of how this works, which is the abiotic factors. I know we've been sort of kicking around these ideas, but in this particular discussion, we're going to really face it. Now, these abiotic factors are really important. Like, for example, the nutrients that are in the soil. These are chemicals that are really crucial that organisms need to pick up. And some of these chemicals are also in the air. Like, for example, carbon dioxide and oxygen and nitrogen. And so nitrogen and phosphorus, these are chemical elements. And what we're going to discuss in this video is not in the details of it, but just an overview. This, this is the introduction to ecosystems. But we're going to talk about how those chemicals cycle between non-living abiotic sinks, if you will, or... or, or uh, the word I'm looking for is reservoir, into the living organism, and then how those are broken down and then brought back into it. And so let's get into that conversation. So I find this to be very interesting. This is a picture, again, of wonderful Yosemite National Park, and this is Mirror Lake. And so an ecosystem, this is considered to be an ecosystem because you're, you're looking at many different species that are interacting with one another and how they interact with the non-living environment. So that's the whole thing. That's sort of ecosystem is sort of it epitomizes the definition of ecology, which is the interaction of organisms and their environment. And so it's all of these things. And so I just wanted to emphasize a couple of the main points in our discussion on ecosystem. Some of it's a little abstract, and so I hope to clarify this, meaning that energy flows through an ecosystem, okay? Energy flows, and the operative word there is, whoops, <laughs> the operative word there is flows, as opposed to cycle. So when we mean flow, we mean that, for example, the sun, the, so the source of energy of photosynthesis is coming down in the form of light, and it's being picked up by photosynthetic organisms, mainly on the land, it's plants. And so that energy you would think is being stored and it is in the form of let's go red here in the form of carbohydrates so sugars right there and so what happens is if an animal comes along which is a heterotroph an animal comes along let's just say it's something like this and it consumes that energy in the form of a of a chemical carbohydrate a sugar What's going to happen is that it's going to utilize that energy and some of that energy is going to be dissipated in the form of heat. So in other words, it's going to burn the sugar. You've heard that expression before. So this is something called cell respiration where it's taking in oxygen and burning the sugar and it's producing carbon dioxide and water, H2O, and as a result, it's burning that energy. And it's also some of the energy is being lost in the form of heat. And so, you know, in the, there's physical laws being governed here that are, that, are, that are responsible for this phenomenon. But I want to make sure that there's no, um, and I said that there's a little bit of trickiness to this. There's a law in science called the conservation of energy, which means that the energy coming in, the potential energy, is always equal to kinetic energy. Potential energy always equals kinetic energy. But the truth is that, for example, the sugar would be stored potential energy. Just think of the sugar that's inside of a leaf that, that a rabbit is eating is like a candle. It has, it has energy. But as you know, when the candle is burned, this is a simplification, when the candle is burned, it disappears. But 
So you need to buy another candle. You need to get more energy if you want more sunlight. But see, the thing is, all of the energy is being converted. It's not disappearing, like vanishing like magic. In fact, the potential energy of the wax is turning into kinetic energy in the form of light, in the form of heat. So it's more randomized. It's conserved, but it's not useful. So in other words, when the candle burns down, likewise, when the sugar is consumed, more sugar is needed, more sugar is needed. And so the energy comes in and though it's conserved, ultimately, it flows through an ecosystem. In other words, the sun comes in and then it turns into sugar and then the animals eat it and it sort of flows out in the form of not usable energy. So energy flows. And so you need a constant influx of energy into the ecosystem. I hope that's clear. Now, this is in contrast to chemical cycling. Okay, let's just cut right to the chase. Every element that's in your body and every element that's in plants and in all the other animals have all, well, all been recycled. In other words, the earth has a finite amount of chemicals and those chemicals just keep recycling over and over. So it's like the, literally like the symbol of recycling like this. And so chemicals recycle. I, I find this to be really interesting. Be, meaning that the chemical elements, like say, for example, the nitrogen in plants, when it dies, it will eventually break down and it'll be in the soil and then new plants will take up that nitrogen. And then an animal will come along and eat that nitrogen. And then that will be broken down back into the soil. And then there'll be bacteria that sort of re return that back into the atmosphere. And so all the chemicals that are in our body, how did they get there? We're either breathing them in or mainly we're eating the chemicals that make up our body. And all those chemicals that we're eating, what are we eating? We're eating plants and animals. And so where did those animals get the nutrients? From the plants. Where did the plants get the nutrients? From the soil. So in fact, we're recycled elements of all the living organisms that have ever lived on the planet Earth. Really, really interesting. And so that's what we mean by chemical cycling. And, and in a separate video, we'll actually talk about in particular, the cycling of nitrogen, and we'll talk about the cycling of carbon and the cycling of phosphorus, because those are major elements in biology. So I hope you can appreciate that right out of the get-go, that energy flows through an ecosystem, because it, it, you, you constantly need to eat, because you're, you're burning the energy. And chemical cycling is that the chemicals are finite, so there's a law of conservation of matter as well. In other words, matter cannot be broken down or destroyed. It, it is conserved as well. And so those are our two physical laws that are governing ecosystems. And so when we talk about chemical cycling and when we talk about energy flow, it, it sort of invokes the trophic discussion, the trophic levels, because this is how we're getting the chemical elements. And this is also if you will, when we burn the food that we're eating, this is also how a lot of the energy is released in the form of heat. And so I can follow a particular food chain here, like for example, the frog is eating some kind of plant like this, and then that's being eaten by, let's just say, a jackrabbit, which is then being consumed by the predator coyote. And so this is how the elements are traveling through the ecosystem, the chemical cycling. And so the elements that were once in the plant are now in the coyote. So how do you like that? The elements that make up your body, how did you get them? You got them from eating like a carrot or a salad or eating a burger. This is where the chemicals are coming into and they move through the trophic levels. And so I find that to be really, really important. And so let's get throughout some, some fundamental terms that are important for us in our discussion. And so I may have used this term a couple of times before, but we talk about plants on the land as being autotrophic, meaning that they're self food producers. Sometimes they're even called producers. Sometimes they're called primary producers because they're photosynthesizing. So on the land and in the water, we have algae. And in, and in particular, 
The most numerous photosynthetic organism is your phytoplankton. And so what happens? They're using the sun's energy. Let's go over here. They're using the sun's energy through the process of photosynthesis. So the energy comes down in the form of the sun and the elements that we're discussing here are carbon dioxide. So CO2 is being taken in through photosynthesis and it's being converted to a sugar. Now sugars will come up later in a discussion, but basically the formula for a sugar or a carbohydrate is CH2O in general. So it's carbon water or carbohydrate. And so carbon is stored in the leaves or in the roots or in a fruit in a plant. Okay. And so this is photosynthesis and also the plant releases oxygen gas and it takes in from its roots water. And so this is the chemical reaction that we know as photosynthesis. And so this is a source of energy. So let me highlight that in yellow. This is our stored energy or potential energy. So plants use energy, the sun, to synthesize, in other words, to make. Here it is, they're making. Photosynthesis is a synthetic pathway. So they're making sugars and other organic compounds. Now, I'm not showing this, but they could take sugars and break them up and produce amino acids or lipids. And so organic just means carbon containing. And where, where, do the, where does carbon come from? It gets pulled out of the air. So we have carbon in our body. How did we get it? Well, we are eating things. Like, in other words, we're eating a piece of bread, we're eating a carbohydrate, or we're eating pasta. That's how we get our carbon. But ultimately, the pasta is, is uh, crushed down wheat, and where did the wheat get it? It pulled it out of the air. So carbon dioxide is the source of carbon for all carbon-containing compounds, like proteins and DNA and RNA and sugars and lipids and fats. So that, that's really critical. So primary producers are producing sugars, and this is the source of energy right here for later trophic levels. And so um, say, for example, an herb, herbivore is like this deer is coming along and it, it's really hungry and it needs to eat something. It needs to get some energy. And so what it's going to do is it's going to eat the, the primary producer. It's going to eat the autotroph. And so it's going to be eating the sugar. And so herbivore, something that eats an herb, sometimes is, some, is called a primary consumer. So that's level one. So it's directly consuming the plant. So sometimes we call this as a vegetarian as well that is directly eating vegetables or herbs. So herbivore, vegetarian, primary consumer. And so this is the first level up right in here. So the, the chemicals are going into not just carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, but in a plant, I'm not going to get into it in this discussion, but there's nitrogen that goes in, there's phosphorus that goes in. And so all the elements that are in plants go in that, that make up the animal. So this is like, say, for example, this is us. So everything, the elements that we have in our body come from eating the plants, and then we incorporate them into us. It's pretty cool. And so we call ourselves heterotrophs, eating something other. So we don't make our own food, we have to consume it. So the deer is a consumer, it's the primary consumer if it's eating plants, and it's also heterotrophic, meaning that it's eating something other. And so it's the first level up. And so clearly it, this is critical here that it, it depends on photosynthesis in order to survive. So how do you like that? We need plants in order to provide energy for survival. So that's to be noted. And so the next level up, like, you know, poor deer. <laughs> but again, if without the carnivore, we'd be in trouble because the carnivore, as you may know, is keeping the herbivore population in check. And so carnivores are the secondary consumer, which means they're eating the primary consumer. They're eating herbivores. Carny comes from uh, the prefix meaning meat. So these are meat eaters, as you can kind of tell by the 
the teeth of this mountain lion <laughs> that it's capable of, of doing that. So it's like not only can it bite with its incisors, but its cuspids are rather pointy for tearing meat to, to really adapt it to that. So here, this, this diagram is very helpful right here. You can see both energy flow and chemical cycling here. So the energy, let's look at energy first. Energy is in these dotted red lines. And so the energy is flowing in, it's being picked up by plants and it's being stored in the form of a carbohydrate. And then as it turns out, a lot of the energy is kind of not hitting photosynthesis, it's just hitting soil, if you will. So a lot of energy is lost. And then the energy is then picked up by herbivores, but they're burning it. And then some of the energy goes up to a carnivore and it's eating it. And then ultimately, you know, you can even have a level beyond secondary. You can even have a third level called tertiary consumer. That's level three. And if there's enough plants, you can have a fourth called quaternary or four level consumer, but you really need a lot of plants in order to do that. And we'll talk about why when we get into a video called energy pyramid, because there's a lot of energy lost when you move from one trophic level to another. I can just foreshadow it right now. Only 10% of the energy goes up from the organic matter in one level to the next. So you have 90% loss. So if there's 90% loss at every level, you have, you have to have a tremendous amount of plants in order to provide for quaternary and tertiary level. So the chemicals, uh, not, no loss there. The chemicals are just, in other words, cycling from plants to animals to secondary, et cetera, et cetera. And then when the organism dies, um, dead organisms are, are called detritus. And so one's living material is detritus. And so is, any, is anybody eating detritus? Yeah, there's microorganisms that are, that are consuming dead things. <laughs> and so we have, these are called detrivores. And so that brings up our, our next conversation. And so detrivores are, are an extremely important group of heterotrophs. So they're detrivores, sometimes they're called decomposers. And so they get the energy from the detritus. So they get their energy from eating dead things. And again, that's very important because the non-living organic material plays an important role in the chemical cycling. Because not only are the detrivores getting their energy from eating detritus, but they're breaking down those larger molecules into smaller ones as a consequence. And then that is in the soil. And that's how plants are going to be taking up the chemicals from the soil. So they, they're they sort of the conduit, the link between the living the non-living, and then the next generation of plants, those decomposers are. Things like fungi are very important in bacteria. Now, animals can be detrivores as well. Like, for example, the classic is like an earthworm. Now, it's eating like plant material, and it's going through, going through. It's getting energy, but it's also breaking it down, breaking it down, breaking it down, and then it poops it out. And so it's making it smaller. It's taking something like, if you will, just just to be silly, it's eating in some plant material and it's breaking it down into smaller and smaller and smaller. And so these elements are now available for the grass that's living here, is the soil and the root system to be able to take it up. So remember, you can't break down these chemicals. You can only recycle them. So these chemicals are going through and so now they're made smaller and then these chemicals go into the plant right here. And then when an animal comes along and consumes it, I'm not sure what that is, but when an animal comes along and consumes it, then it incorporates the chemicals back into it. So the decomposers are really important. And so um, this detrivore, if you will, is an animal that helps to circulate the chemicals in the ecosystem. Now there's another type of detrivore called a scavenger. And so it's not typically included as a detrivore because it's eating a lot. It's like, it's eating like meat, for example, like here's a hyena, uh, vultures are classic examples of scavengers, but in fact, they're breaking, they're eating dead things. 
So they're, it's a detrivore. So it's eating detritus, something that's not alive. And so ultimately it's helping in the recycling as well. Now, decomposers, um, I, I, I alluded to them, are fungi and bacteria. And so like when a tree falls in the forest, this is a lot of detritus. There's a lot of nutrient in here. And so fungi and bacteria will break it down smaller and smaller, and then that'll go into the soil. And then plants will pick the, that back up again. And so decomposition connects all the trophic levels because then it goes back into the plant and then the plant is going to get eaten by the herbivore and the carnivore. And then when that dies, it gets then broken down. And so decomposition connects all of the levels. And so perhaps it's most important. How do you like that? It's really, I just pause for a second. How do you like that in terms of a lesson in life? That bacteria, the most simple organisms on the earth are what make it all possible. They're the ones that are um, connecting the trophic levels. It's really uh, humbling to consider that. So organic material that's making up living organisms gets recycled by, by decomposition. And so this is a, a wonderful photograph right here. Look at the fungi. It's kind of white in appearance. Interesting. Now fungi are not photosynthesizing, so you can't expect them to be green. And so they're consumers. What are they consuming? Dead things. So they're, thus they're uh, not only decomposers, but they're a, a type of detrivore. So in other words, they're eating dead things and they're decomposers. They're breaking it down and making it available for autotrophs in the future. And so I hope you be, uh, enjoyed that beginning introduction to ecosystem ecology. Thanks for watching.